everybody. Stand to your feet. Who is happy to be in the house of the Lord? All right, we're going we're gonna to make a joyful noise. You ready? I don't care what your noise is, but when I count to three, you're going to make a joyful noise as loud as you can. Ready? One, two, three. That's not bad. I like it. Let's try it one more time. One, two, three. All right, let's sing with that same enthusiasm. Can you do that? to start a service.
forgotten you are not hopeless but you have been broken your innocence stolen i hear you whisper underneath your breath i hear your so today. I pray that you help us listen to what dad has to say, and I pray that you speak to our hearts today. Love you, God. Amen. You may be seated.
So today our message is what to do when you failed. And I know that nobody in this room needs this. Nobody here has ever failed. And, and I came across a very interesting um, experiment. They put four monkeys in a room. And they put a p- tall pole in the center. In my mind, I didn't see pictures, I just read about this. In my mind, it's like, a, like you know, the pole that the, at the fire station that they come down. So there's this tall pole in the middle of the room, and they put a whole bunch of bananas at the top of that pole. So what do you think the monkeys did? One by one, they would start to climb the pole, and as soon as they would reach out to get a banana, they would be doused with this blast of ice-cold water. They would scream, they would run back down, and they would go to the corner. Well, then another one do it. Blast of cold water, go to the corner, another. They all did it several times until they finally stopped going for the bananas. It just was not worth it. So then the experimenters took one monkey out. They put another monkey in who had never been up the pole. And as soon as that monkey started to go, the other three monkeys grabbed him and pulled him down. Would not let that monkey go up there. They had, the, the new monkey had no idea why, but the new monkey eventually stops. They did this with all of the monkeys until all of the monkeys in there, none of them had ever received a blast of cold water, but they would not let their friends go up because they're going to pull them down because they learned this behavior from someone else. They had no clue what was going on. Now, <clears throat> folks who've gotten used to failure are kind of like the monkeys in the room. They're so used to failure that they're not even going to try to succeed again And then they're going to hang out with people who are used to failure, who are going to keep dragging them down. The scripture is very clear that bad company corrupts good morals. And so if you want to succeed in life, you have to have a different opinion towards your failures. We all fail. The key is what we do about it. There's an old saying that says, if you always do what you've always done, then you'll always get what you've always gotten. You keep doing the same thing over and over, you're going to experience the same results you've always gotten. you got to get on a new path, and that's what we're going to talk about today. All of us fail. The difference is how we respond to failure. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but there are some people that just seem to be able to put failure behind them quicker than others. For example, Michael Jordan. Y'all ever heard of him? He said that if his team lost, he immediately put it out of his mind because he's going to win the next day. There's always going to be another game. I'm just going to put it behind me. I'm going to win the next one. He knew there'd be another one, another opportunity to win. Did you know that entrepreneurs, do you know the number of failures that they have before they succeed? On average, not the the first one doesn't succeed, the second one doesn't succeed, the third one doesn't succeed. On average, 3.8 failures before an entrepreneur succeeds. There was a soccer player, and and this will show my age, but back when when I was... uh, uh, a grade school kid back in the 70s, there was a famous soccer player, and, and soccer wasn't very big in, in the United States, but he was famous, and I've never forgotten his name. His name is Kyle Rote Jr., and here's what he said. He said, there's no doubt in my mind that there are many ways to be a winner, but there is only one way to be a loser, and that is to fail and to not look beyond the failure. It's to fall down like the runner running over the hurdles, falling down and sitting there looking at the, the hurdle that you knocked over instead of getting up and continuing on the race. Folks who've gotten bogged down are a dime a dozen. Those who rise up above their past and make something of their future are the ones that we respect. Because when you boil it all down, the problem of people's past mistakes, there's, there's one of two responses, two ways to respond to it. Number one is either to experience a breakdown or to experience a breakthrough. Which do you want to be known for? The person who broke down and never got different, never made changes, or the person who makes a breakthrough? I want to be a breakthrough. So when I, this, I came across this a long time ago, and about every 10 years I bring this back up. It's this thing called rules for being human. Here's the first one. Rule number one, you will learn lessons. Rule number two, there are no mistakes, only lessons. Okay, we can argue about whether there's mistakes, but but if you look at them correctly, they're lessons. Rule number three, a lesson is repeated until it's learned. Here's one of my favorites. Rule number four, if you don't learn the easy lessons, they get harder. Pain is one way God gets your attention. Now, I just had to stop here, and I had to look this up, and I've used parts of this quote before, but here's the longer C.S. Lewis quote. Go ahead and put it up there if you would. So I'm going to have to read it. I don't have it in my notes. 
This is C.S. Lewis. We can ignore even pleasure. Okay, so his whole argument is pleasure doesn't do us a whole lot of good. But look what he says. But pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasure, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone, his, capital H. It is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Now, I love this. No doubt pain as God's megaphone is a terrible instrument. It may lead to final and unrepented uh, rebellion, but it gives the only opportunity the bad man can have for, go ahead, amendment. It removes the veil. It plants the flag of truth within the forest of the rebel soul. Pain is one way your heavenly father can allow you to get to a point where you will seek him. And none of us, I'm just telling you, I don't know any of us in this room that would choose pain. But if it drives you to your knees and causes you to call out to your heavenly father, it changes your eternal destiny. And I'm willing to bet that any person that I've ever done a funeral for, if they were not a believer, if they could come back at that moment and stand up and I could interview them, they would tell you, do whatever you can to follow God. Because if God, if the Bible's true, if Jesus Christ is who God says he is, he died on the cross, he was laid in the, in the tomb, he resurrected, but only the people who follow him into heaven are those who bow the knee and ask God to forgive them and to lead them. So pain is one way God gets our attention. Rule number five, you'll know you've learned a lesson when your actions change, not your words, your actions. Now, folks who don't learn lessons... Make a lot of excuses. Hear people make excuses? Do you love it when your kids make excuses? Do you love it when your spouse makes excuses? So when I got to thinking about excuses, I wanted to find some, some actual insurance forms where people made excuses for the accidents that they had. First one, an invisible car out of nowhere, struck my car and vanished. And I put, this is parentheses at the bottom. This is my parentheses. This is the Wonder Woman defense. You know, she has an invisible plane. Why couldn't she have an invisible car? Here's another one. The indirect cause of this accident was a little guy in a small car with a big mouth. Now, I put rampant at the bottom because if this is the cause of accidents, they should be everywhere, right? Here's another one. I'd been driving my car for four years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. If you've been driving for four years, it's about time you had an accident. Okay, here's a good one. I was coming home, pulled into the wrong driveway, and hit a tree I do not have. I can, I can see the logic in that. Okay, this is a great one. The pedestrian had no idea which direction to run, so I ran over him. That makes total sense. You don't know where the car is going? Just run over him. I'm sure there's, I'm sure this might be the number one thing on like I-45 or one of the major interstates. I was just keeping up with the cars behind me. That doesn't work. Okay, this is the best. This is the best. I pulled, I pulled away at the side of the road, glared at my mother-in-law, and then headed over the embankment. It's just too much. I'm done. <laughs> now, we laugh at that, but can you imagine if you're the insurance adjuster going, no, denied, 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 right? It's pretty foolish, but I, I, I think we need to admit that some of, the, mis, some of the, the excuses we come up with are just as foolish sounding as, as these. So let's look at failure, and let's look at to some common responses of failure, and then figure out how we can do better. One common response to messing up is to blow up. We don't have any people that blow up in this room, and if you do, you're not going to admit it, and, and your spouse should not elbow you. Okay. Lots of folks get mad when they mess up, right? Sometimes it's a rather mild mistake, but some people will angrily overreact and attack their family, their dogs, their fence, their whatever. Um, But here's the problem. Unchecked anger actually makes a small problem bigger. And if you need a, a biblical example, think back to the Garden of Eden after they had their first two children, Cain and Abel. Cain made the mistake of bringing a subpar offering to the Lord. God rejected it. Cain got mad and killed his brother because his own offering wasn't any good. God had even warned him. He said, sin is crouching at your door, waiting to overtake you. He didn't care. He got mad at God, killed his brother for it. 
One author said, bad temper is its own scourge. Few things are more bitter than to feel bitter. A man's venom poisons himself more than his victim. And if we don't govern our, our tempers, our tempers will govern us. Here's another way people react to messing up is to cover up. The natural tendency is to cover up. And so it's as old as Adam and Eve. We'll go back to their story. What did they do when they made a mistake? Who did they hide from? God. That's pretty foolish, right? And one of my, one of my favorite stories is, is Jonah in the, the VeggieTales version of Jonah. Jonah says to God, so God says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Jonah had a problem with the Ninevites. They were sinners. They weren't Jewish. He was, he was racist long before anybody used that term. And so he's like, God, I'm not going. So he runs away. So here's what in, in the movie, in the VeggieTales movie, he, Jonah says to God, you don't want me to go to Nineveh. You've, you've never been there. You don't know how bad those people are. I can't go talk to them, God, because they're really, really bad people. And don't you know God's just looking at him going, you're one of those really, really bad people. And you're not being obedient. And do you realize how much energy it takes to cover up our mistakes? And most people already know. We need to learn from our failures going to the next one. It's okay to fail. If you're not failing, you're not growing. But rather than cover up, we need to fess up. Right, We need to admit it when we've failed. Here's another way people respond to failure is to speed up. Now, this is, this is like the person, you know, they know they've messed up, and then they're going to try to try to get out of it by just doing more and more and more and more. So it's like being in a mud puddle when, you're, when your car is stuck and you just push the gas down, and, man, you're flying. The speedometer says you're going 100 miles an hour, but you're still in the same place. You're not getting anywhere. Or it's like a child. You ever watched a child with one of those shape things and they're trying to put it in the wrong hole? Now, now a lot of kids will figure this out, but those that are A-type personality, oh, no, 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 this should go in there. I'm going to make it go in there. And they try harder and harder and harder to make it go in there. That's what people do sometimes. Um, they forget <laughs> that just going faster isn't going to change your mistakes. I think of Paul. Paul wrote half of the New Testament. But Paul, before he was a Christian, he was the Jewish Jew. He was like, you know, on the cover of Jewish Monthly. They didn't even have that. But he would have been the, the number one Jew of the time. And he actually gives his testimony. He says, I was better than all of you. I had the number one teacher. I was better at everything. And he thought that he needed to protect God. And so he goes and he's arresting and killing Christians because he, he was so worried about God's reputation that he was going to kill him. Until one day he's going to Damascus, ready to arrest and kill more Christians. And Jesus shows up and he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And here's the crazy thing. The way Saul was persecuting Jesus was by attacking Jesus' followers. Jesus identified with the church, with the body of Christ. And he said, if you're attacking them, you're attacking me. And, and so instead of working harder, Saul had to just change his whole life. And in fact, he didn't do anything for several years. He witnessed, but then he just studied and he allowed the Holy Spirit to teach him. Then he becomes the greatest missionary in the world. He wrote half of the New Testament, started churches all over the Mediterranean area because he finally admitted to who he was. Here's another one, another way people respond to failure, back up. Have you ever heard, I mean, I know this happens with kids when they say something and it's like, oh, I'm telling dad. I take it back, I take it back, I take it back, right? But have you ever been in an adult conversation when somebody says something and you go, excuse me? And then they start backpedaling, you know, they're, they're just crawfishing, going backwards. And no matter what they say, you know, they, they just can't backtrack enough to try to justify the remark. It only makes them look more feel, foolish. Well, when you go back to Adam and Eve, to that story, I just keep referencing it. Whenever they hid from God, God comes and finds them, and God says, who told you you were naked? And, you know, the, well, the woman, Adam blames Eve. Eve says, well, the serpent, nobody took their own responsibility. They were trying to back up, trying to cover up. They look pretty foolish doing it. And then um, there's one more bad one before we'll get a good one. This is give up. I heard a report that said that 90% of all those who fail are not really defeated. They just quit. Thomas Edison, I just looked up some stuff this morning because I wanted to see. Thomas Edison said, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. And I know you've heard all kinds of stories about this, but I was reading this one this morning. And so he wasn't the person who invented the light bulb. He was trying to figure out what the filament should be. 
And so he goes into partnership with this other guy who actually was way ahead of him in the light bulb thing, but couldn't figure out the filament either. And then there's a report that says there were 2,774 attempts to find an appropriate filament that would make a light bulb last more than just a few seconds. When he finally figured it out, it was carbonized bamboo. Who would have thought of that over 100 years ago? Another report said that he was working on batteries and a guy came down to his office or his, his workshop and he had just hundreds and hundreds of batteries laying all over the place. And the guy said, how sad it is that you've worked seven days a week, 24 hours a day, as long as we can, and you've, you've not figured out any more. You've not made any advances. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. What you don't understand is I've made over 9,000 attempts to find a new type of battery. I know what doesn't work in a battery. Don't tell me I haven't made advances. I've made 9,000 advances. And then he eventually gets the battery the modern battery. So if those are the bad things, and if there's a natural tendency to do one of those five things, then, then what should we do? Well, the number six is we need to wake up. We got to wake up to the power of the supernatural. And I want to quickly show you the story of two men. Both of them are failures. One we don't consider a failure. The other one we very definitely do. Failure number one is Peter. Now, last week, we talked about him boasting. The night before Jesus died, Jesus said, you're all going to fall away. And Peter says, not me. I will never do it. And look what he says in Mark 14, 14 uh, 29. Even if everyone else deserts you, who never will? I never will. And just a few hours later, he denies Jesus for the third time. And at that moment, Luke 22, 61 and 62, at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered what the Lord had said before the rooster crows tomorrow morning. You will deny me three times. And Peter left the courtyard crying. How? Bitterly, because he, he was an abject failure. And so I, I want to I wanna ask you what Peter did. I want to ask you if you've ever done what Peter did. Peter underestimated how difficult it is to follow Jesus. Anybody underestimated how difficult it is to follow Jesus? Peter overestimated his own ability to follow Jesus. Anybody overestimated your own ability to follow Jesus? But here's the crazy thing. Jesus gives him a second chance. You know the story. They go fishing, and, and Jesus shows up on the shore, and they catch all these fish, 152 fish, and Peter can't even stand it. He just jumps in and swims to, to Jesus. And in that whole scene where, where Jesus is making fish for them to have breakfast on the shore, Remember, he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? He was restoring. Peter denied him three times, and then he professed in front of others that he loved Jesus three times. See, the, the Hebrews have a word for, for God's unfailing love, and it's called chesed, H-E-S-E-D, but, but they, I don't know why they do the ch. You know, it's kind of fun to say chesed. Say that. Oh, yeah, y'all got the ch part. Chesed. And what it means is steadfast love. When we fail like Peter, God offers us forgiveness. He offers us love. His, his faithfulness lasts forever. His loyalty never ceases, regardless of our failures. And regardless of how long you've been running from God, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how long you've done it. The scripture describes God's love as chesed, steadfast, loyal, enduring forever. Now, we can choose to be like Peter after the rooster crowed or Peter after Pente Pentecost. After the rooster crowed, he, he was weeping bitterly. Jesus restores him. After Pentecost, he preaches the first sermon, and 3,000 people come to Christ in Jerusalem. You want to be like Peter after the rooster crowed or Peter after Pentecost? That's a question. Peter after the rooster crowed, Peter after Pentecost. Peter, Piper, pick the pick the, Okay. He could have wallowed, but instead he, he humbly accepted God's offer of mercy and grace. And I want to ask you a question. Do you think there was ever a man in the history of the world who heard a rooster crow day after day and wasn't reminded of the chesed of God like Peter? Rooster crows, he denies him. He's restored, given the gift of the Holy Spirit, made the, the, one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church. I think for the rest of Peter's life, he heard the rooster crow and was reminded his mercies are new every morning. 
Then there's the failure that we describe as a failure, everybody describes as a failure. His name is Judas. You know, some of you know this. He was the treasurer for Jesus' disciples. This was an honored position. You didn't get that position unless you were trustworthy. And he wasn't. He stole from Jesus. And uh, nobody other than Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus knew that Judas would be the betrayer. Jesus always knew, and he knew from the beginning. And he still treated him with love and respect. But not long before Jesus was crucified, a woman comes in and, and breaks a an incredibly expensive vial of perfume and, and anoints Jesus. And, and you, if you put all of the different scriptures together, you find out that, that Judas is the one who calls it a waste. All of the disciples say, oh, this was a waste. This was a waste. We could have sold this and given it to the poor. This was a waste. And Jesus said, the poor you always have with you. You're not always going to have me. And he's, he said, what she's done, she's preparing my body for burial. And what she's done is beautiful. And, and as long as there are people on this planet, they will talk about what she's done. But it was at that moment that Judas decided, I, I've had enough of Jesus. I can't take what he's doing anymore. And he made his plan to sell Jesus out. And we're told in Matthew 26, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests and asked. So this was right after that scene of the waste. How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for the right time and place to betray Jesus. So i got a question for you. Which, which one of them was the greater betrayer, Peter or Judas? Both. They both betrayed him. But there's a difference. It's not the degree of betrayal. The issue is what did they do next? Peter's heart was broken. He wept bitterly. He waited until the sun came up and eventually Jesus restored him publicly and it was miraculous. But Judas, Judas stayed on the failure freeway. He refused to get off. And look what happens to him in, in Matthew 27. When Judas, who had betrayed him, Jesus, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse, so he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and other leaders. Another place it says, he says, I've betrayed innocent blood. And they're like, so what? We don't care. And he throws the money onto the floor of the temple, and he went out and hanged himself. What I don't think people realize is how close Judas was to forgiveness. We don't know whether he went out immediately that day after Jesus was condemned to die and hung himself. We don't know if it's the next day. We just know that he didn't hang around long enough to see Jesus on the other side of the tomb. And we, we look at him like a failure. Now, the interesting thing, I keep bringing this up because I keep hearing this from this congregation. It's a waste to take money to the park and give stuff away. It's a waste that we took money to Mount Olive Baptist Church. And I keep cautioning you. You're in a dangerous place when you say giving God's money to someone in need is a waste. That is an indication of your heart, not the heart of the church, not the heart of the board of the pastor. When you have that attitude, you're saying to God, you are better at being God than he is. Because what Jesus did was Jesus named Judas the son of perdition. So the word is perdition. When, when Judas said, what a waste, he said perdition. It's perdition that she poured out this perfume. Jesus called Judas the child, the offspring of waste. You don't want Jesus calling you the offspring of waste. The way you become the offspring of waste is you fail and you stay in your failure. And you try to pull other people down into your failure because failure loves company. The difference in, the, in these two, Jesus never called you the offspring of waste. He never called Peter or any of the other disciples the offspring of waste. He never called me the offspring of waste. Why? Because we're not just throwing our, our lives away trying to block the kingdom of God. Peter held on. His world had fallen apart. I mean, because you think about Peter. On the night that Jesus was crucified, he thought that guy was the Messiah. Now he's dead and in a tomb. His, it's over. And people say, oh, well, it was just group think or it was, it was group um, hypnosis that they all thought they saw Jesus alive. No, do you know in order to be hypnotized, you have to believe in the hypnotizer? Nobody believed Jesus was coming back. They all said it was over. 
And so then when they saw him alive, it changed them from cowards into you can do whatever you want to me. I will never again deny my Savior. So who do you want to be like, Peter or Judas? Peter, I hope so. So how do we do that? Well, number one, you got to see yourself clearly. This is how to wake up. you got to see yourself clearly. <laughs> a bishop said this, Most of us do not like to look inside of ourselves for the same reason we don't like to open a letter that has bad news. Some of you see only the bad in yourselves. Some of you see only the good. We need to do both and see clearly if we're going to be who God wants us to be. It's what we were talking about in men's group this morning. We, we need people who will speak into our lives. See yourself clearly. Number two, admit your faults or your flaws. Admit your flaws is what I put on there. I'm aware of, of a lot of my faults. I'm not aware of all of my faults. I have blind spots just like anybody else does. And there's some men in my life that have the, have the I've given them permission to call me out if they see something in my life that is not measuring up to what I should be. And, and is it fun? No. But I need guys who will love me when, when, I, when I see only the bad in myself and they're like, no, 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 there's this and this and this. Get up, get up, shut up, get up, go back and do. <laughs> the grace of God, and I won't go into the details of this, but this was several years ago. I was driving to church totally distraught. It's like 6 o'clock in the morning, nobody's out, I'm on the loop by myself, and I'm driving, and, and this had to be God. Because this friend texts me, he says, hey, buddy, I love you, and I'm praying for you. And so I just texted back, I said, I got nothing. I'm done. So he calls me, and he started speaking life into me. He said, did God give you a word for new life today? I said, yes. And he said, you are to preach. And he just... Encouragement is when you put courage in someone else. And he said, the, the Lord has called you. You're built for this. Get up and you preach that sermon. Like, yes, sir. <laughs> you need people who do that. People say, you're not worthless. You're also not the greatest. Right? We need that. Someone who's going to confront, and here's, here's what I want us to realize. You need somebody to help you realize this. We need to recognize what we cannot do based on skill. There's some things you shouldn't do because you're not skilled. There's other things you're skilled at. Let's, let's have somebody help us figure those things out. There's some things you should not do based on talent. You're just not talented in that area. They made, they made a whole franchise on American Idol of people who suck, right? They became, they became famous because they had no talent. And then you need somebody to help you figure out what you ought not to do based on character. I mean, there's just some right and wrong. Would you agree there's right and wrong? I think the people in this room and watching would agree. There's a lot of people out there that don't, don't believe in right and wrong. And it's, Casey and I were talking about this. You've heard the... Well, I want to speak my truth. I guess I'm showing my age because that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Let me just ask you, what is two plus two? No matter how loudly I scream, it's five. That's my truth. That's just stupid. Okay, we're going to move on. Admit your flaws. Number three, discover your strengths. I don't even know where that came from. No one has achieved their dreams working outside of his gifting, her gifting. To excel, you, you got to do what you do well. And whatever you do well, you should be doing in some form at this church. I have just enough piano skill to get through level four at Baylor University. Level four is you suck, but we're going to give you a music degree anyway, right? Right? But I had to do so much, and I practiced, and I practiced, and I practiced, and I suck. So you don't want me playing the keyboards. Brian is exceptional, right? Dude plays. There's times, there's times at rehearsal. He'll play, and I go, oh, do that, do that. Because I'm going, yes, Jesus, you know. I'm worshiping just because he's, he's using what God has gifted him. Does this make sense to you? You're not called to sit there. You're good at something. And you should be doing it in the church. 
Number four, build on those strengths. So you got to discover them, then you got to build on them intentionally. You can reach your potential tomorrow if you start building your strengths today. Because I want you to see this. Write that down, then I want you to look up here before we put the next thing up there. Because I think this, this is profound to me. Maybe it's not profound to you. Only the mediocre are always at their best. <laughs> I don't want to be mediocre. They never see the need to exert themselves. But in order to change in this world, you're going to have to yield to God's help to change you. So I came across this thing. We'll finish with this. It's called Autobiography in Five Short Chapters, and it explains how to get off the failure freeway. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It's my fault. It takes forever. Oh, it isn't my fault. Sorry. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. This is where people finally come to celebrate recovery. Like, man, I can't do this on my own. I'm powerless to overcome this on my own. I need a higher power. Chapter 4, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it, which sounds smart until you see chapter 5. I walk down another street. (laughs) Does this make sense? If there's a certain place where you always fall, don't pretend it's not there and fall in again. Go down a different street. Which brings us back to what I said earlier. If you do the same thing you've always done, you're going to get the same results you've always gotten. Let's do something differently. The key to overcoming does not lie in changing your circumstances. It's in changing yourself with God's help. That's what Peter did. It's what Judas failed to do. The Bible is just filled with real stories of real people who screwed up. Let me give you some names and you tell me yes or no if they screwed up. So just say yes or no. Samson, big screw up. He was a he-man with a she-weakness. David. He was a he-man with a she-weakness. I'm not going to do that every time, but David, did did he screw up? Yes. Committed adultery and then had her husband murdered. Ah, the prophet Elijah. Did he screw up? Yes or no? Yes, he did. He was so distraught, he said, God, if this is the way it's going to be, just kill me. Have you ever prayed that? I'm going to tell you I have. God, if this is the way my life is going, you just take me out. And and I think God's like, really? Because you don't have it bad. And one of the things God's taught me is in bad situations, it can always be worse. We're not living in Florida right now. I love Florida. Do you want to be there? By the way, Janie and I were on, on a ship, and we came within 500 miles of Ian. First time ever I've been on a cruise ship that I thought I was going to fall out of bed. It was that bad. I wake up catching myself before I hit the floor, right? So I'm, all I'm saying is you don't want to be in Florida. We were 500 miles from it on the Gulf, and it still was just knocking us around. People bouncing off a wall, literally bouncing off walls. It was fun. It was super fun. <laughs> okay, Elijah wanted God to kill him. Peter, did Peter ever mess up? Yes, he did. Paul, did Paul ever mess up? Or how about this one? Some of you don't know this one. John Mark, he's the guy who wrote the Matthew Mark. He wrote that. He was such a sissy boy that when they went on the first missionary journey, he leaves them, goes home. On the next missionary journey, uh, Barnabas said, let's take John Mark. And, And Paul says, oh, absolutely not. He's a deserter. But the really cool thing, when Paul's writing his last letter, he says, send John Mark to me because he's very useful to me. So not only had God restored John Mark, Paul had restored John Mark. And he says, I need that young man to come comfort me before I die. Maybe the whole key is we need to change our definition of success. This is from John Maxwell. Here's what he says. Knowing your purpose in life, growing to reach your potential, sowing seeds that benefit others. Knowing, growing, sowing. So part of my purpose in life is to help people meet God, no matter how far away from God they are. I want them to hear about God and be able to connect with God. And if they come ask me questions, I love when people ask me questions. It's one of my favorite things in the world. And if I don't know the answer, I'll go, I'll go research. And we can study that together. 
I know my purpose, and I want to grow. And so I keep reading the Bible. Every day on the, on the ship this week, I was reading the Bible. I go to my little place, have my cup of coffee, and I'm reading because I don't think, I'm, I, don't think I know enough to be a pastor. And so i got to keep, keep growing. And then we're going to sow the seeds. What we're doing next Sunday morning is we're sowing seeds, and we're praying to God that He'll take one of those seeds. And, and let's be honest, I don't want just one person to, to change their opinion of church. I want 100 people to change their opinion of church. But I'm probably not going to come in contact with 100 people. But if we all did it, you have an opportunity this week, and it's $28.52 to fill up one of these baskets, one of these, one of these bags. And, it, and I'm, I'm honest, sincere when I say this. If you can't afford $28.52, just let me know, and I'll give you twenty-eight fifty-two. The church has money in benevolence. We, I would love to give a hundred bags out next week because somebody's going to ask, "Why are you doing this? Why would you come mow my yard for free? Why would you paint faces? Why would you hand out bags of groceries? Why would you have clothing in Reagan Park and give them away?" It's because there's a God who loves us enough that He came to this earth and He died on the cross. And he saved me from my sins. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life telling other people about him. And if I have to go to Reagan Park to plant some seeds, I'm going to go to Reagan Park and plant some seeds. And I'm going to pray like crazy this week that God will make those seeds grow so that somebody comes to know him. And I'm just going to tell you, there's going to be a day in heaven. We may not even know it until we get to heaven. Somebody's going to come up and say, I'm in heaven because of you. And you're like, why? And you remember when you went to Reagan Park? You remember when you dedicated yourself to Celebrate Recovery year after year? we got some people that have been doing Celebrate Recovery for 17 years. And they keep learning. They said, I just keep pulling back another layer of the onion, and God keeps showing me stuff, and they keep coming. And, and, and we celebrate when people, when people get right with God. And we cry when people walk away. But we're going to keep doing what's right. And if we mess up, we're going to say, we messed up. That was a dumb idea. And if I, I tell you this, I give you, if I stand up here and say, man, that was a dumb idea. I did this as a dumb idea. You can say, I know that's right, baby, and I won't be offended at all. We're like, let's not do that one again. Let's, let's learn. Let's, let's have some wisdom. But let's also look for people who are down in the pit of despair. And let's come alongside them. And let's pour courage in. That's why the church was created to be the family that, that other people don't have, to be a supplemental family. You are my brothers and sisters, and so I will treat you like that, whether you treat me like that or not. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you for showing us that we don't have to be defined by our failures. Peter, we don't even think of that until we start talking about his story. We think about all you did through him. We think about all you did through Paul, all through David. David is considered the greatest king in the history of Israel, and yet he screwed up. But, but the screw up is not what defines him. You're the one who defines him. So, Lord, it's my prayer that everybody in this room, everybody that's listening, would be defined by you, their loving Heavenly Father, not by their past. So, God, wake us up to the possibility of an incredible future if we're following you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.